You are listening to Demystifying Organizations. In partnership with McGraw-Hill Education, I'm your host, Jeff Shatton. My guest today is Nate Bennett. Nate is a professor of management and the faculty director at Georgia State University's Executive MBA program. He's published in many widely read resources for managers, including Harvard Business Review, Wall Street Journal, Business Week, and Forbes. He's a co-author of two books, Riding Shotgun, The Role of the COO, and Your Career Game, How Game Theory Can Help You Achieve Your Professional Goals. I'd like to welcome to the podcast, Nate Bennett. Nate, thanks so much for joining me. Well, thanks for having me, Jeff. I look forward to our conversation. Yeah, this has been a long, a long time in the making on my end. Um, I first had you as a professor when I was an MBA student at Georgia Tech, um, probably about 2010, 2011, when I had you uh, as a professor. So yeah, I don't want to do that math. <laughs> so it's nice to have you about 10, 10 years later on the other end. Appreciate it. Um, so you've done a, you've done a lot of work, some articles, and a lot of thinking about generational differences. Starting to think through um, how we think of the the boomers, Generation X, the millennials, and now um, we're coming uh, you know through the COVID era. And uh, you had a recent article that came out that was looking at as as millennials move into the C-suite, as they move into executive positions, and how we should start thinking about them as a generation. Um, so it's going to kind of drive our conversation today. And I wanted to start off with, um, you know, how do you think of what is the millennial generation, um, both its definition, but also, you know, how, how is it different than um, previous generations? Okay, yeah, that's a great, a great place for us to start. Um, millennials are generally considered to be those born between 1980 and 2000. Um, they are, uh, you know, obviously you can do the math. They're in their early to mid careers now. And I became interested in them because uh, the average age of a, of a first time CEO is uh, early 50s, 53. Uh, and it won't be long before the 53 year olds are all millennials. Um, and while certainly there, have, there are millennials who are out there leading companies, uh, you know, with successful startups and the like. Um, they haven't been the leaders yet of the, the sorts of companies that really form the basis of the global economy. Mm-hmm. So I thought it would be interesting to, to spend some time thinking about that. I think it becomes even more interesting when you consider some of the, the baggage that the millennial generation has been forced to, to carry. They're, they're a, a pretty uh, heavily maligned generation. And, Why is that? Well, why? Interesting question, right? I think, first of all, I think all generations are maligned. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think, I think uh, uh, you know, it's understood that each generation feels, uh, you know, smarter than the one that it's following and, and uh, you know, better able than the one that's coming up below it. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think what's been different for the millennials is they've, they've uh, been targets at a time when social media has just amplified voices. Um, it, there, are, there are so many channels through which to pump uh, disparaging content. Uh, and it becomes almost impossible to, almost impossible to fight. So I, I don't know that there's any reason to believe there's anything more particularly broken with this generation than was broken with any other generation, but there sure have been opportunities to scream about it. Mm-hmm. And as you know, those perceptions become reality, right? I mean, people begin to believe that press. And if your generation is viewed as, you know, lazy, entitled, and narcissistic, um, those are not attributes that people uh, want to associate with the leader of a Fortune 500 company. So how, how, do the, how, how does that play out um, in organizations right now? Are you seeing that? Millennials are treated differently than, let's say, right, uh, thirty-year-olds from twenty years ago, or let's say when, when you were when you were coming when you were in your twenties, 
um, was your generation treated differently than the current generation in their 20s? Uh, so that's a that's an interesting question and makes me want to reflect a little bit. Um, you know, I, I think that to tie back to to the point I just made about the um, the stereotype, um, I'm a boomer. Uh, the boomer stereotype, I think, um, was not as um, brand damaging when it came to the workplace, right? So the boomer stereotype is really around uh, competitiveness. Um, and if anything, being too competitive, and that's thought to have come from the fact that uh, there was never enough of anything for boomers as they were growing up. Um, so that's a, that's a different sort of stereotype, and it's not so much one that you'd have to, to overcome come in the same way because it aligns a little better with what organizations might be looking for uh, in somebody. You know, I think, though, that the, the older generation is always going to view the next generation with some suspicion until there are enough proof points to, to demonstrate that the stereotype doesn't fit. And I mean, that's the that's the place where we are with millennials, right? We, we, we don't have enough data yet to know if we can put that stereotype to bed or if that stereotype's real. Because what I'm trying to understand is um, teasing out the difference between generational differences. So there are things that some generations experience that form their identity, right? We think very much of the greatest generation, which I think saw the most trauma more than anybody else, right? And their parents. So if you think of our, in the, in the American story, at least, you, know, you have World War I, the Great Depression, and World War II, back to back to back, which is just a mass traumatic series of events. Um, right. And when we, as bad as COVID and 9-11 and the Cold War have been, um, nothing quite like those, the, the early parts of the 20th century. And, and so um, there, are, there are major events that frame who we are and that we all have this shared experience that is, that is simply different from the generation before. Um, so like we were talking about uh, before, the, um, the advent of social media, our digital lives, the digital natives, um, is very much a product of the millennial generation. So, so to me, that's on one side, right, which is, um, you know, and the folks that we can go all the way back and say, of course, the people who lived through the Civil War, that, that you know, is going to traumatize a generation. Um, on the other hand, um, there are unique attributes to simply what it means to be um, in your 20s versus in your 50s. And um, that's, there's a universal element, right, to what it means to be somebody who is wandering in their odyssey years of their 20s um, that probably has a lot in common today versus somebody 30 years ago to be the uncertainty of what it means to be 22 and 23 years old versus the certainty of what it means to be 52 and 53 years old. So how do we think through kind of these, the parts that are just common about human aging um, versus that would cross, cut cross time hundreds of years versus the um, eras that we live in and the unique elements of those eras? Yeah, so this is a really great question, and, and, and before I get to it, though, I need to I need to react. You you, you suggested that there was somehow a, a certainty when you were in your fifties about things, and I'm in my fifties, and I'm thinking, boy, I could use some certainty right now. <laughs> <laughs> there doesn't seem sure. to be a whole lot out there. Yeah. But um, the broader point that you're making is absolutely, uh, I think, at the crux of this, right? So sociologists would. Uh, differentiate between what they label age period and cohort effects. So age effects are attitudes and behaviors that are uh, caused by uh, the fact that you are a particular age. And, you know, there are things about teenagers that have pretty much always been true for every generation of teenager. It's a function of that age. Period and cohort effects are a little harder to disentangle from each other. Um, but that's that's really what it is that you're speaking about. So the the, the period effect is an, is something that impacts you. Um, that is the case because it's descriptive of something taking place during that period. So the depression is a great example of a period effect. 
Okay. And we probably, at least most of, most of your listeners probably had a grandparent who up until their last days would, uh, at a restaurant, fill their purse with sugar packets, uh, to take home. Right. And that's a, that's a behavior that was learned in the depression when sugar was rationed and scarce and you never knew when you were going to run out. Right. Didn't matter how much sugar was on the shelves in the grocery store. Now that was a, that was a habit. Um, cohort effects are similar, um, but they include the, the age that you are during the period, basically. So, you know, one of the things that I use as an example is, uh, you know, to your point about World War II, um, World War II had an impact on school children who will remember drills where they had to hide under their desks, right, as, as, as if somehow that was going to magically protect them from, a, from an air raid. Um, that's an effect of World War II. Or, or the nuclear weapons ones. Or, from, right. When you were a kid. Right. Or I don't know. I don't know. Did right. you have those as a kid? Were you too old uh, for them? We had know? shelters that we asked questions about. We never did go into them. Okay. But there were, they were labeled at the school. So, um, uh, but anyway, that's, that's a very different experience uh, than, it, than, than what was faced by the 18 and 19-year-olds who landed on the beach in Normandy on D-Day. Sure. Right. So that's a that's their cohort experience uh, of World War II was very different than the cohort experience of World War II if you were a school aged child. So what we have with millennials uh, in their you know roughly in their thirties now uh, and a little older um, is um, a reputation that's been assigned to them based on the way they were in their teens and twenties. When in fact, what we should be thinking about are, to your point, the period and cohort effects, because age effects go away by definition. You age out of them. Um, and uh, a period and cohort effects, just like the, the person shoving uh, sugar packets in their purse, um, those last forever. So, so yes, yeah, so, so one of the concerns about the millennial generation is that uh, you write about it in your article that they're the trophy generation or um, that they get a participation ribbon and the identity that goes with that where they have the expectation that by merely showing up and being a part of things that they should be rewarded, which of course is not how organizations uh, function and that's not how our reward and feedback systems work within organizations. So I thought maybe, maybe start with, um, I think you have a great story about you and your son and then <laughs> maybe connect that to um, how are you thinking of managing uh, millennials as they move up the organizational chart? Yeah, I'm not so sure my son feels it's as great a story as, uh, as you might. But yeah, I, I, um, I can remember very clearly the sort of the first vivid example I had about this, um, this cultural shift, really in the way that we parent. Uh, and my, uh, my wife and son had gone to the neighborhood swimming pool for a, a swim meet. Uh, they returned from the swim meet, and my son, he was about five at the time, he, he was beaming with pride as he showed me the ribbon that he had won for his, uh, his swimming, and it was pink, um, and I was confused because I didn't understand what a pink ribbon meant. Um, he explained that he got pink because he came in eighth place. And, you know, I'd been to the pool, and I knew there were eight lanes in the pool, so as a boomer, uh, that's last, yeah. <laughs> not, not eighth, that's last. And there's a difference in the way you frame that, right? But he was, he was proud as could be and displayed that on his wall and we let him have it. And, uh, you know, that was his, uh, that was his experience. Um, so, and I think that's a pretty sort of, it's a true story, but it also, I think is pretty much on stereotype with the way people think about, um, the way people think about millennials. Um, as you translate it to the workplace, you know, I think it's clear that, that there's an expectation that there will be very frequent feedback, right? And I think the, the expectation is that there will be a lot of positive feedback. Um, it doesn't mean that you can't give constructive criticism, but your basis of authority in order to be heard with that constructive criticism is really important because millennials have grown up in a structure where their parents were very quick to take on anyone that was critical of their child 
or who got in between their child and a goal. So they, they grew up seeing parents yell at little league coaches, parents yell at umpires, parents. And my parents would have never thought to criticize a volunteer coach. Right. Um, they, you just didn't do that. So the, the, the questioning of authority combined with the how do you give constructive feedback, um, I think there's art to that. And, and people that are interested in developing millennials are going to have to uh, figure, that, figure a way through which to do that, to how establish you, themselves you, as credible that doesn't rely on the org chart, and then to present a message that isn't uh, too threatening. So how, how would that look? And how, how would that be different than um, somebody who's of the boomer generation who's um, accustomed to the fact that they're not perfect and showing up is not count as success <clears throat> and the expectation um, that, uh, that there is lots of improvement that's needed? We can just imagine this is a very different world than stepping into a meeting um, with your supervisor and thinking, I've already done everything. Um, I've got very little to improve upon. Um, how, how, do you, how do you structure that kind of feedback um, given that in both situations you need improvement? Yeah, so, you know, I think that the, if you think about the boomer first, um, you know, you always needed the job more than the job needed you. So the whole context for the conversation was very much in the supervisor's favor, right? You, you were predisposed to listen because you knew that if you weren't able to get the job done, they weren't going to have a difficult time finding somebody else to, to take your place and do it. So it's really just a very different sort of conversation. Um, the, the, I think that, you know, you know, as, as someone who is, a, who is an expert in, in behavior, I think to, to try to get people to listen requires that you understand a little something about what it is that matters to them. You know, what are the metrics that matter to them? And how can you have the conversation that serves your purpose framed in a way that helps them see that what you're suggesting also will help them achieve their purpose. Okay, so it, it, it requires maybe a little more uh, thought and, and perhaps in the communication a little bit more nuance. But how do I, if you want, for example, to rise in this organization, one of the things that you're going to have to be able to demonstrate you can do is, you know, influence other people in this particular way. And we have results of a 360 feedback that seem to indicate people are not really finding you credible, not really believing you, finding you standoffish, uh, finding you self-absorbed. And it's going to be hard for me to promote you to the position we both know you want if you can't make those folks cheer for you the same way I'm cheering for you. So, right. so it's a that would be a millennial oriented conversation. That's different than the boomer oriented conversation would. So it's a, it's a movement from, from pulling on hierarchy towards shared goals, right? So in, in, the, in, the, in the first context, you can use your hierarchical leverage a little more. And with the millennials, you pull them on, on that we're on the same team. We both want what's best for the organization and what's best for you. And this is how you're going to get there. I think that's a piece of it. And then I think part of it is also how you establish your own um, authority, mm -hmm. right? So it, it isn't, it isn't uh, I think the goal alignment, yep, absolutely right. But I think it's also what you need to do to be credible mm -hmm. for a millennial is to not be resting on seniority, but to be resting on competence. Mm -hmm. If you think, you know, if you think back to class and the various bases of power, right, it's, it's expert power, not legitimate power. So how do you think, will this change with COVID? So the millennials now are going from, so we, we are in, you know, we just went from, you know, in January, 2020, the unemployment rate was 3.5%, the lowest in 60 years. And now we're going to the worst unemployment rate since the Great Depression, somewhere around 20%, maybe it might top out at 25%. So the uh, need for workers is, is, is going to shift fundamentally and it already is. I mean, do you think that will change the dynamic um, for millennials and, and uh, seeking feedback. So this is a this is also a great question, and it's one I've spent some time thinking about. What makes it complicated is that the you know the unemployment is kind of lumpy, right? So one of my sons, actually the the ribbon winner, is a a, a chef at a restaurant in Brooklyn, 
Uh, they've been closed for, I don't know exactly, a couple months uh, and will be closed for the foreseeable future. Um, the employment rate in that industry is practically zero. Yep. Um, you know, particularly in uh, in the five boroughs there. Uh, and what it looks like, what that industry looks like going forward, hard hard to predict. Hospitality, you know, hotels, uh, you know, what that looks like going forward. And again, unemployment in that sector. Uh, I don't know what it would be, but it's higher than higher higher than. Uh, than any of us could have imagined. Sure, they've already okay. said that. They've already said the jobs under. Uh, I think uh, uh, Jerome Powell said uh, for jobs under forty thousand dollars a year, the unemployment rate's already forty percent. Yeah, that's incredible. So a lot, and so a lot of this is is not just industry. Um, it's right. Who can work remotely, well, like, like you and I are? I'm gonna. I'm, I'll I'll push back a little bit of that and say that there's a there are some industries that are notoriously low paying, and so um, the restaurant industry being one of them. And, you know, the reason I mention that is, you know, we have students no, no, no. It's just, right now. just that the remote, just that the, the virus has hit the industries that are, are, you know, more atoms and less bites. Yeah, that's fair. So what I was, what I was going to say is that, you know, we have students in, uh, in our MBA program who have internships um, this summer, uh, for example, working in supply chain consulting. Yeah. Uh, they were very worried the internship was going to go away. Absolutely that's not. That's going to be an exciting area. That's yeah, like, that's, oh man, that's, that's going to be a hot area. Yeah. If you want to, if there's an area you want to be in right now, yeah. it's supply chain. Yeah. So I guess to get back to your original question, yeah. you know, I think that the, I think there are certainly going to be industries where if you want to stay in that profession, um, it's going to become, uh, you know, much more of a dog eat dog world and expectations for frequent and positive feedback are going to have to go out the window. Expectations for rapid promotion are going to have to go out the window. Um, but I also think there we'll, we'll find that there are other industries where that's much less the case. And so I, it's hard for me to give you a, an answer to your question because I think we're still sorting out, you know, just sort of where, um, where the disruption from COVID is going to be the greatest. And, 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 where it's less likely to be able to come back, right? I mean, depending on your economic forecaster, unemployment is going to be in the single digits by September, September of 2025. I mean, you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, which which way that goes, um, you know, will do, will drive a lot of this. And I remember after the, you know, after the the last uh, recession. It was a long time before it became clear that that there was actually a solid recovery going on, and, yeah, and this is, I think, one, a much know, more tremendous collapse. Yeah, I mean, in the last one, the unemployment rate peaked at ten percent. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It was it was minor league compared to what we're faced with now. Yeah. Yep. Um, so I want I want to turn our attention to um, the question of uh, back. We mentioned at the beginning, but, but digging a little bit deeper into the question of social media, mm -hmm. and. You know, there's there's a lot out there. In terms, you know, we have a generation that uh, everything is online uh, for them, and their entire life history is online. Mm -hmm. And unlike in the EU, we, we don't have the right to be forgotten. So pretty much anything that a millennial has done is contained somewhere um, in, in the internet. And if you dig if you dig back far enough, you can find it. And there's a lot of stories of people who have you know that their careers have been ended because such and such and such was found on their Twitter account from a while back. Um, but I want to kind of push back against that just a little bit, which is, sure. um, and, and then I want to get your, your response. We're also finding that, you know, I think because information is so ubiquitous and people's histories are entirely out in the, in the public, that there's just so much noise that we'll probably find a few careers that are ruined, but also I think our tolerance for bad behavior is actually going up a lot. Um, and, and I just, just what comes to mind would be something like, you know, Elon Musk smoking pot on the Joe Rogan podcast, um, the president of the United States and pretty much everything that he does that has just, I think, shifted uh, like, like him, hate him, whatever uh, his, you know, you know, behavior online shifts, I think, our tolerance for what is allowable online. And then you, you add that to just the cacophony of noise that happens. Um, so, so I want to get your response about, yes, there's some examples, but um, and feel free to disagree with me. But, I, you know, I think there's just so much out there that the threshold is going to get really high for what is ruinous for, um, for, for somebody. 
So I, you know, I don't really think about it as agreeing or disagreeing with you. I, I hear you stating a hypothesis, and um, there are alternative hypotheses, <laughs> right? Um, it, it's interesting when you think about public figures now who who behave in brazen ways. How the how the people who hear that are processing it. And are they processing it in a way where they just have to do dissonance reduction? Right. So I, I want to vote for, for this president because he's going to appoint conservative judges. And so while what he said about women is reprehensible, I have to come up with a way to resolve that dissonance in my head so that I can vote for him because he's the one that's going to deliver me this stuff. Right. Um, on the other hand, I read a story the other day about liberals selling uh, Teslas. This is apparently a very good time to buy a used Tesla <laughs> uh, because people have become fed up with with Musk and his his yeah. antics. Um, so, you know, I think those both of those explanations are out there. I think the alternative hypothesis, Jeff, that I'd offer to you is that I I think this is going to be um, um, one of those things from which we overcompensate on a puritanical end. Mm -hmm. You know, I think there will, be, there will come a time when people say, you know what, this is just ugly and it's not what I want for my family. It's not what I want for my neighborhood. It's not what I want for my community and my country. And, uh, you know, we may actually become more discriminating. Uh, when we're when we're trying to think about who it is we want to give power, so there there is my alternative. Are we are we that. seeing are we seeing this on the hiring front? I, mean, I know um, there we there's been really good data that shows you know uh, I think it's something like two thirds of employers at a minimum Google their employee before mm -hmm. you know in the HR process they're going to do some basic screening. Um, but from, do, do you um, do you have any any thoughts on that? And then um, on the uh, generational differences. Um, so most of what I hear when I, you know, when I talk to our, uh, you know, students who are going through the hiring, uh, hiring process and, and people I talk with who are in the placement business, um, there's a, uh, there are lots of admonitions to, you need to clean things up. Like we have looked at your page and there is some stuff out there that does not, that would not reflect well on the company. We expect mm -hmm. you to address that. So I haven't heard stories uh, uh, of someone being rejected for that reason. Mm -hmm. Of course, I probably you wouldn't, wouldn't hear that story yeah. because they wouldn't have been told that either, right? But what I'm trying to do is, is reinforce your point, which is I think employers are definitely looking and are definitely cognizant of it. Um, to tie it back to generations, yeah, I mean, I think it's clear that the, the, the millennials and then even more Gen Z their entire life uh, is is being documented uh, and is being posted online. And I wish I could remember um, the organ. I don't know that it's an organization so much, but there's a um, there's a, a group of folks who are um, now of age who are trying to take action against parents because they're they're realizing that their social media wake includes everything their parents have posted about them. And so now their coworkers have a little, you know, a picture of them when they were in the splash pool without a diaper when they were two, and they don't really feel that their coworkers need to need to see that. Right. So what, what damage are parents doing? to the social media wake of their children. And that's a that's so, something think, that a boomer did not have to deal with. No, not at all. I, mean, I think we should have a statute of limitations on this stuff. Uh, honestly, um, you know, just in the same way, I'm very glad that when I was 17, there was no social media. So there's no, um, you know, I, I, would, I can't imagine what I would have posted at 17. It wouldn't have been good. I wouldn't want to yeah. go today. I feel very fortunate that that wasn't available to me as a high schooler. Yeah. Um, yeah. But if it was, I would want there to be some kind of statute of limitations uh, where- Funny that you're using statute of limitations. I think you mean expiration date, don't you? No, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I mean, just from a hiring standpoint, we're like, look, if you've done something or written something in the last ten years, let's say you've got somebody who's fifty, right? That's fair game. Uh, if it's completely egregious, fifteen years. But after that, we're just gonna, you know, we have a limit, some kind of limit where we're like, because here's the thing: is that 
I think we have to fundamentally recognize that, you know, I, I actually am a millennial, by the way. Um, I was born in 1981, so I'm, I am, I'm technically a millennial. Um, uh, just as a, a complete aside, I often joke with my wife because when we don't see eye to eye, it's because she's a different generation. <laughs> she's 1979, I'm 1981. Um, but anyway, so, so that for, for any of us, that we should not be held accountable in, in, you know, for most things within normal limits of something that was 20 years old or some capacity um, in the social media environment. I don't worry about myself now because there's nothing coming out that I have anything to worry about that I would ever post. But I understand that you know, if you are 17, 18, 19, 20, 21 years old, um, there's stuff that can, you can post that just stays up there. Well, we go back to, I, I agree, we go back to sort of age period and cohort effects, right? And you can remember, um, uh, even as a millennial, you can remember back to, to Bill Clinton and what a big deal there was and all the, the spin he had to do about how, I think it was Bill Clinton, where he had tried marijuana but not inhaled. Yeah, it inhaled. Right? Yeah. You know, and, you know, and now look at what we're, you know, considering the bar, Oh yeah, that would never matter today. <laughs> for elected office, right? So, so the standards do change, and I I think that a a smart employer, right, a, a discerning employer is going to be able to make a differentiation, right, between a youthful indiscretion, right, mm-hmm. is what they would call it, versus a pattern of behavior that would suggest uh, someone was untrustworthy, or unpredictable, or compromised. Right. And, 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 and uh, as a result, wouldn't be a good keeper of the secrets for the company. Um, so, yeah, that I, you know, I think I, I you know, I'm, I'm with you. The, the, but I think a, a smart employer would recognize that the talent pool would just shrink terribly if, if everybody that put a picture of them looking a little inebriated on Facebook during their college years was somehow now not eligible for employment. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, do, do you think uh, the social media, um, communication method on, you know, for Twitter, 280 characteristics or less, or just the shorthand writing and shorthand communication. Um, is that going, do you think that is creeping into professional communication? And I guess the analogy that I, that I think of is, you know, the, the movies from the sixties and TV shows from the sixties are fundamentally different than today. And I don't mean just on technology, the writing, the speed, like the speed at which things happen. I can't watch a movie from the 60s. It's too slow. Like movies today happen, you know, event, 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 activity, activity, activity. And now it's supersonic speed in terms of professional communication where we're constantly, it's Twitter and texting. So is that, how is that going to impact uh, generational differences in professional uh, communication? Well, it's one of the things that I worry about because, um, and I, you know, I think this is friendly to your observation, the short form, you know, helps train people to be pithy. I don't think it helps train people to be thoughtful. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if let's say I've got two employees and um, um, one, one's, a, a, you know, of one ethnicity and one's of another ethnicity, and they're having a difficult time establishing a trusting relationship. I'm not going to solve that by tweet. I'm just not. And if I'm not able to to find ways to thoughtfully communicate i mean and i hate to think of more than 280 characters as long form, that's now <laughs> long form. well you can string you can string your tweets together now so <laughs> tweets together, right. you have a thread. as long as you don't get distracted right but you know so so i think that's the 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 you know one of the one of the executives that i interviewed in in the research i did you know her line was that Millennials were great at using their phone, but not their voice. Mm. And to me, I think that that sort of sums it up, right? I mean, it's, it's are you practiced at using your voice, at really having impact, at, at being the sort of person, you know, the, the, the commercials back in the day, you know, the, the sales rep from EF Hutton was about to say something and the entire dining room got silent because they knew what was going to come next was going to be really profound and important. I don't know that anyone waits that um, uh, excitedly for a tweet. Yeah. Uh, and so that's I, think the, that's, I think, the challenge. And I do think it's one of the things that if, if I were a, a coach to a millennial now who had their eyes on the C-suite, I would be encouraging them to work on how do you find your voice and how do you 
how do you say things that really have impact where you're not just trying for, you know, trying for tweets, trying for likes. That's a, that's a very millennial scorecardy sort of mentality. And as I said, it, it, it suggests you're funny, um, but it doesn't suggest you're thoughtful. All right. On that, that's a great, that's a great uh, way for us to, uh, to end our conversation. So uh, Nate, I really, really appreciate you coming on. I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you. It's been too long and uh, congratulations on all you've got going on. Thanks. We'll, we'll be in touch. All right. Take care. Thanks for listening to the podcast today. If you have any questions or comments, you can email me at jeffshatton one at gmail.com. You can tweet me at Jeff Shatton. If you like this podcast, press the subscribe button and make sure to rate it on iTunes so that other people can find it. Mm-hmm.